All right. Hey, hey, and thanks for joining us for today's Search Engine Journal webinar. It's my favorite day. It's Wednesday. And today we're going to be talking about content marketing and how to find the true value of your marketing funnel. With me, I have the SEO team leads from DAC. I have Bill Franklin, Director of SEO, and Oliver Tanny, Senior Director of SEO. Oliver, Bill, thanks for joining us for today. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for having us. Yeah, I think it's your first webinar. And so I'm going to go over some quick housekeeping and then I'm going to turn it over to you guys. For anybody out there who doesn't know me, I'm your host. I'm Heather Campbell, the director of marketing here at Search Engine Journal. With me, I have Jonathan and Shannon in the background. They're going to be helping out if you guys need anything from a tech perspective. So first, um, let us know in the chat where you are from while I go through these housekeeping. So if you need closed captioning, it's the CC in the top right of your screen. Just give that a click. We are going to have some time for a Q&A at the end of the presentation. So if you have questions for Bill, use that chat box or the Q&A tab to let us know. You can give questions that you like a little, give them a little thumbs up, a little upvote, and that'll let us know that we want to front load those questions, maybe um, important to you all out there. At the start of the Q&A, we're also going to be opening a breakout room. So we're going to have Oliver, Emily, and Mario in that breakout room to showcase a successful client campaign um, that they worked on and how DAC broke that down into a holistic, again, successful campaign for, I think it was a cruise line, um, if yeah. I remember correctly. So, so yeah, yeah, we'll see how that is. <clears throat> And then before you leave today's call, I'm going to ask if you can stick around to take a quick survey. It just helps us know how today's event went, how we can make them a little bit better. And so today's a little bit of a different format. So love if you could give us your feedback. And then lastly, last thing um, is you will receive today's recording slides. It'll be in your inbox later. So watch for that. Okay. That was a lot of words. So I'm going to break this down. Bill Oliver, I would love to hear more about you, DAC, and share that with our listeners today. Great, thank you. So I'm Bill Franklin, I'm a director of uh, SEO with DAC. I've been in the industry about uh, a little over 18 years now, um, and just uh, eager to run through some uh, ways we can better measure content. Awesome. And Thanks, Bill. Uh, hi, Oliver Tawney. I head up SEO at DAC. Been with DAC for about five years now. Um, in the industry for about 20-ish. Uh, hate to age myself there, but uh, so just a little quick intro about DAC. Um, leading international full funnel marketing media agency. Help marketers connect with consumers from enterprise level all the way down to hyper local. Um, everything from SEO, paid media, content strat, uh, creative storytelling, et cetera. Um, all about delivering industry leading results through data informed strategy, resulting in growth at every part of the customer journey. Um, that's something that's very big and near and dear to our hearts. Um, so with that, I'm going to kind of jump into what we're going to be talking about today. So looking at, um, starting with some content goals and what content is supposed to accomplish. We're gonna talk about attribution and then we're gonna tie it all together with some uh, use cases and, and examples of uh, some of the ways in which we're able to do that. So first of all, does this sound familiar to anyone? You know, there's always someone in the room saying, you know, what are we getting from our content efforts? Uh, how many leads does this blog generate for us? You know, do we, you know, even need to focus on things that, um, you know, maybe we only need to focus on things that drive revenue right now. Um, it's one of those questions that we get over and over in many different ways. Um, and it's something that we, <laughs> we face ourselves with, you know, and, and definitely sometimes it feels like we don't have an answer, but I believe that there's a way to get to an answer um, through the way that we measure content. So a quick poll. Um, what would you say is the most important KPI for your content? Awareness, engagement, bottom line. And then there's one other choice, obviously. Yeah, too many times we don't leave that. You know, they're all important. And then the chat starts blowing up. So we figured we'd give it to you as an option here this time. All right. So 
they're starting to come in. So let's let everybody see what this looks like. So as of right now, we've got, you know, 48%. So half of our viewers are saying they're all important, right? Um, not surprising there. And then broken down and 5% says awareness. Um, oh, now we get 10. All right. I love to see Give it. those. I do, I do. Um, yeah. And we love to see that they're all important. That's the thing. Um, yeah. So yeah, with that. I'm going to close this. And so, so to kind of get us kicked off and sorry, let me pull that back down. There we go. All right. Um, so to get, get us kicked off, you know, we're talking about one of my favorite topics, value and funnel. Um, and in or, so let's start from the beginning. You know, the first part of any campaign is to start with a goal, right? Where are we trying to get to? And then based on that building and aligning, you know, the role of content with what it is supposed to be doing. And taking that a step farther, you know, into building that customer journey, I'm so excited to hear the framework and what considerations, you know, you all are taking into account. I can tell you that from our last year's state of SEO survey report, marketers noted content production, content marketing, and content strategy as being the most difficult parts of SEO. We're not surprised, and I'm sure everybody out here is like feeling that too. And what we're seeing, you know, we're seeing that across literally all experience levels, not just newbies, but, you know, those that have been in the industry for you know 15 20 plus years too and so with the push to helpful content oliver walk us through what developing a modern customer journey one that's designed to reach our campaign goals and ultimately you know rolling up to support those overarching business goals so yeah excited to see what you have for our, re for our listeners here today absolutely will do thank you um so looking at things like content goals and wondering what content is supposed to accomplish. Um, we like to look at things at DAC from a, the customer journey framework that we use is based on thinking, planning, doing, and feeling. So you've probably seen a number of different versions of this where it can start with the awareness phase or the evaluation and then conversion or advocacy. But um, we like to talk about it, you know, in the thinking, planning, doing, and feeling. Um, and we're using Michael here as an example. Um, so to kind of illustrate the thinking phase, Michael's asking certain questions or going through certain things in his head. Um, do I need new glasses? Do I need a prescription? Um, he's basically looking for information. He's open to suggestions and starting to find some brands that are showing up. Um, he is, of course, kind of non-brand specific at this time. Um, a lot of upper funnel searches and you know, he's one of those folks who's going to click on the people also ask fun uh, function within Google, or he's going to refine his queries a few times in order to get to the, the things that he's mostly interested in. Um, so the goals at this, at this phase is to educate the audience, kind of build that brand awareness, um, is try to establish yourself as a thought leader. Um, and then of course, engaging and nurturing leads. Um, but then Michael's a little bit more advanced at this phase. So he starts moving into the, the planning phase. So he's thinking, okay, I know I need glasses. So what size do I need? Or what options are there within my price range? What's near me? Um, what's material is right for me? So more research oriented. He wants some validation. He's starting to narrow things down a little more. Um, still kind of mostly non-branded at this point. Um, a lot of upper and mid funnel searches. Um, but then when we start talking about content goals, it's, you know, we need to demonstrate things like availability, um, being clear with the value prop that we're able to provide. Um, and there's gonna be definitely some, a number of uh, formats where we're gonna be engaging with, with Michael. So hopefully Michael then converts into the, the doing phase where he starts to say, you know, hey, I really want some Fendi glasses or can I get this at Costco, for example? Um, you know, he wants that seamless checkout, uh, you know, and definitely the could be open to an intelligent upsell or cross sell. Uh, so this is where, you know, the customer is kind of looking for some assurance. It's a little more sensitive to friction and expecting convenience. The search behavior, definitely a little bit more lower funnel, bottom funnel, however you, you say it. Um, and then a lot of times it's gonna be branded or even model specific, um, very specific type of glasses or very specific brand of shoes, uh, for example. 
And then, so the goals here, you know, we want to streamline that checkout process. We want to make sure that he knows that it's free shipping, priority shipping, um, and provide an easy path to purchase. So looking at things like CRO and, and reducing the friction in terms of going from uh, lead to sale to actual purchase. So, and then one, one part of the customer journey that's sort of post-purchase uh, is the feeling phase. And this is someone who is thinking about the experience they just went through. Uh, was it a positive experience? Um, was it something that I'd be willing to share? Was it a positive to the point where I'd be consider myself a little bit more engaged with a particular brand? Um, and at this point, the, the goal is to, of course, deliver uh, some stronger customer experiences, build that connection, and hopefully build a uh, an advocate in the in the process, and then also provide that possibly provide that that advocate of yours, say the tools for sharing or you know basically helping spread the uh, spread the word about your brand. And so, looking at the customer journey, there's obviously a number of different touch points, like I was saying, and so it could be anything from organic search uh, where we first reach them, or maybe it's through the blog or a TV commercial. Um, could also start seeing them within reaching, uh, you know, users through display or, you know, through word of mouth or other buying guides they might be seeing online. Um, and then of course, when they're going through the doing, they're in that doing phase, um, they might reach you from a local ad or through a branded paid search ad. Um, and then of course, maybe an additional site offer that's encouraging them to purchase um, and then leading them into that, that feeling phase. So all of that said, which part of that, which piece of content there do you think would have been responsible for making a sale to Michael for what he was looking for? And again, that poll should pop up for most of you. If not, it's under the polls tab um, up next to the chat. And here, we'll push this up. It looks like they're just starting to come in. Here we go. Again, you've got the majority of, of your people sitting in all of the above. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about, too, right, is where that attribution comes in. Yes. We'll give everyone just a moment to finish, but uh, then we'll dive into attribution and how that affects the answer here. And we've got and only... Yeah, sorry about that, Bill. Um, but yeah, it looks like we got about 78% people saying all of the above. So I'm excited to get into kind of that multi-touch attribution, but we're not, we're not, we don't want to tease them and let them know um, what's coming. So, you know, we've got the goals. We talked about the, the content mission. What is its purpose in life? Um, and now we're going to talk about, you know, that attribution. And I love bringing this conversation to the table. So, you know, back to that state of SEO report um, that we did, looking at the one from two years ago, you know, it was interesting that marketers listed improving attribution as dead last. It was like the last thing on their list that they were focused on improving. And when we did the survey just last year, that moved up to eighth. And so you definitely see, you know, marketers and SEO professionals putting more emphasis behind attribution. And a lot of it has to do with proving that value, right? So, so yeah, Bill, what do you have for us? Thank you, Heather. So the answer is going to honestly depend on your, your attribution model. I think we can all agree that each piece of, uh, or each touch point along the way guided the users, user uh, to the extent. Uh, end goal of conversion, but along the way, there's many factors that are, are driving that decision. Um, what we are going to face is um, how that's counted from, from your analytics, uh, either solution or, or model. So attribution at a high level, um, if anyone's not familiar, is, go, is looking at how a user was converted, um, what are the touch points that were most critical along their customer journey, and then assigning value to those touch points. Uh, most of us are probably going to be using at last touch attribution right now. Uh, this is focused on looking at the last touch point a user is facing before they make a conversion as that's triggering the sale. Um, 
one issue we're going to see with that is, you know, we have 78% of people agree that multiple touch points were uh, contributing to the sale. But when we're measuring, we're really focused on that last touch point. Um, so there are a few alternatives. Uh, the first is first touch. Uh, this is looking at how the customer was, the customer journey was initiated, how they started their path down the purchase, uh, the, down the purchase funnel and were initiated to the brand. This tends to focus more on the thinking and planning phases. There can be some crossover depending on the customer's familiarity with the product type or what their needs are. Uh, but generally we're looking at those upper funnel or early journey searches. Then we have the, the holy grail of uh, marketing analytics is multi-touch attribution, which we'll dive into in the next slide. Within this model, multiple touch points are going to be given partial credit for the conversion. So there's not one sale driver, but multiples that are recognized along the way. Multi-touch does use a few different models depending on how it's configured and what the business goals are. And we'll, we'll briefly run through those. Uh, the first is linear. Uh, during Within this model, what you're going to experience is each channel or each touch point is treated equally along the journey and given equal weighting. Uh, so if you have five touch points, each would get credited with 20% of the sale, revenue, et cetera. We also have the time decay model. This is uh, attributes the first and last touch point, uh, but with greater and greater emphasis and uh, attribution being given to the later touch points and the final touch point in particular. There are two similar models that have some slight differences uh, between the U-shaped model and W-shaped. Uh, U-shaped model is giving the majority of attribution to the first and last touch point. So where the user was initiated the conversion process and where the user, what closed out or closed the deal there. The W-shaped model is very similar. It's focusing on the first and last, but also gives credit uh, a great way to the middle touch points where the user is making those decisions and guiding through the journey. There's going to be pluses and minuses to, to each uh, model depending on your user flow, the type of content you're using. Um, but part of the decision process for any marketer is what model is most relevant to your journey. Then the, the last model is the algorithmic or custom model. Uh, this is, uh, you may know this from uh, Google Analytics as a the data driven model. It's, it's very robust. It offers uh, many solutions to credit along the way uh, based on the uh, either value or time they've spent within each channel, uh, giving a custom amount of, uh, of attribution to the channel. Although multi-touch or full multi-touch attribution is, is something I think we can all see the value of um, as it is giving credit for which content is making the conversion, there are going to be some organizational and outside hiccups to getting this implemented. Um, from an organizational standpoint, getting buy-in, uh, Heather, as you referenced, uh, I think as of last year, it was the lowest priority for marketers. Um, this year, it's up to number eight. So it is gaining uh, steam and um, people deciding to use it. But it is still a lower organizational priority as it is harder to uh, track revenue being made to attribution, or even though it can affect how you're measuring. Um, there's also model selection, which is going to be the right model. Is it going to be a U-shape, W-shape, custom, et cetera? Selection of vendor, setup time is going to be um, quite a bit, and then the overall cost for measurement. With that in mind, we want to look at a, a simplified approach that is improves on the last touch attribution while also giving credit to content that's initiating the customer journey um, that can be utilized to better understand where your strengths and weaknesses are within the customer journey and how much your content is contributing to that initiation. Within that, uh, we recommend an analyzing both first and last touch as part of your, uh, as part of any um, analysis. This is going to give the benefit of, of measuring the initial impact, um, the initial content impact, and what the impact is on final conversion. With this model though, we do need to make sure that we're prioritizing KPIs. 
based on the marketing goals of each touch point, which Oliver ran through for uh, Michael's case. Briefly, I, I did just want to touch on what this would require from a Google Analytics uh, standpoint. The steps would be very similar for Adobe, uh, just different buttons were clicking, levers were pulling. Um, essentially, when you're setting this up, you are going to need to create a user segment for each channel you would like to analyze, uh, specifically a first touch segment within uh, Google Analytics. This is also going to need to be paired with a combination segment uh, for any uh, pairs of channels you would like to analyze their impact and interaction on each other. Uh, so for an example of uh, if you're doing that SEO, SEM analysis, you would want to create both a first touch organic search and first touch uh, paid search channels and then combinations that are first touch organic search, last touch paid search. Um, first touch organic search and last touch organic search will allow you to see the impact of any content uh, created by organic search, how that's converting either through paid search or organic as the last touch point. Um, and of course, be sure to validate any um, pixels are firing and you are collecting all that in analytics info. So the next section we will jump into some use cases, how uh, you can improve your understanding of contents value, um, and specific reports that we've utilized to analyze this. Um, but before we do, uh, we do want to uh, check in just a, a poll of how well are you, how comfortable do you feel right now uh, with your organization's ability to measure the performance of your content today? And so, this one, as you can see, we've got the majority saying, you know, to a limited extent. And that's why we do these webinars. Great. This is awesome. Sounds like some good opportunities uh, there. It does. And so we'll leave this up for, you know, another quick second or so. I'll leave the poll open. But it looks like they're shaking out, you know, really in that, in that second option. And so, and again, that is exactly why we do these. And I will tell you on almost every webinar, it doesn't matter the topic, um, what we're talking about, what speakers we bring in, you know, one of the questions that we get asked most, um, other than am I going to get this recording later, is, you know, is how do I provide, how do I show value to leadership? How do I get buy-in for content um, that doesn't have that direct revenue? So excited to see how you all, you know, bring it together here and get into some of those those use cases um, and show that value. Great, thank you, Heather. Uh, so we'll run through some example use cases and how this can be applied. One thing I, I really want to know before we jump into different reports or different uh, ways to apply this is we do need to make sure that we're setting um, very specific goals for each type of content that you're creating. Um, every piece of content has a purpose or should <laughs> and a goal of why it's being, um, being created and published. This will vary across thinking, planning, doing, and feeling um, with thinking and planning being more upper funnel informational content meant to delight and inspire and doing the goal is to convert the user immediately. Um, obviously within that, um, thinking and planning are going to be a bit downplayed by a last touch model, which is where we want to bring in both metrics or both uh, attribution models. So we'll run through, uh, take a look back at how Michael's doing. Um, again, during his thinking and planning uh, phase of his journey, He's not quite sure if he, he may need glasses, doesn't know his size. There's, there's a lot of information he's trying to gather before he feels comfortable making a purchase. Your marketing goals at this phase are not directly to convert the user generally. Um, they're, they're very early in their, their journey. Maybe they, they may hopefully convert early, but they are going to probably require multiple touch points. Uh, so you, you want to initiate the customer journey, generate interest. When you're measuring this, the KPIs are going to be very focused on visibility, uh, similar to uh, an ad buy or a, a television spot. Um, so we're looking at visibility from a lens of rankings, impressions, how many people saw the ad, was your, uh, 
ability to rank, how many clicks and visits there are, click-through rate, time on site, some of the typical engagement metrics. What I would recommend layering in is the first touch conversions, conversion rate, and revenue. And this will measure how much revenue was generated as a result of that initiation of the customer journey. So any, any upper funnel content that's being published, such as your blogs or things that may be harder to attribute to a sale, we can now measure how much it's um, eventually closing out after the journey begins. At the doing phase, which is uh, where I think most of us are probably operating right now, your goal is, as a marketer is simply to facilitate a seamless conversion as efficiently as possible. So at this point, Michael knows what brand glasses he's interested in. Uh, he may want to get it quickly at a store or, um, and is going to expect a seamless checkout process. When we're looking at our SEO KPIs that we would use to measure the effectiveness of this doing content, you're really going to be focused on bounce rate. Are there any things that are driving people away from the conversion process or not resonating? And then using your last touch conversion, conversion rate and revenue metrics, as well as ROI, uh, to measure how effectively this content or marketing channel is at closing the sale. And then finally, Michael's purchased his glasses. He had a great experience. Um, the order's been made. So we really want to look for opportunities to maintain the engagement with him and nurture an ongoing relationship where he'll remain a customer. Time, the SEO KPIs for this are, are going to be a bit fuzzy. Uh, we're looking at things like time on site, if ratings and reviews are left, uh, returning users and logged in user traffic. This is probably one of the analysis views um, that's going to be most unique and you're, you're focused on people who have already visited the site who are either logged in, they may be behind the paywall, um, but are interacting post-sale. So again, everything is going to have a different goal or what it should be trying to accomplish. We need to make sure that it's measuring along those lines. So this final section, we'll just run through some examples of how these um, reports that can be utilized, what kind of insights you can gain, and um, how this can be put into action for it measuring across channel. The first example would be to evaluate what your traffic uh, distribution is by the journey phase. Um, so here we've split uh, thinking and planning and doing into two separate graphs. Uh, the left side is looking at uh, first touch. So how did the user, um, how effective were channels at initiating uh, the uh, customer journey and then doing how effective were channels at closing the customer journey. What you'll want to look at here is really your breakdown of channels and how effective they are. Um, so for instance, we're seeing about 18% of organic search traffic coming into the thinking and planning phase, but 21% in the doing phase. This may represent an opportunity to better leverage the quote unquote free organic traffic uh, to reach those early journey customers and maybe shift to uh, closing out with a direct conversion related activities. Another example would be to determine the impact of initial contact on conversion. Um, so uh, when we're being, I think we've all been asked what the value of this content or what does it contribute to revenue, but uh, there are going to be some pieces of content that aren't designed to directly convert. But what they may do is impact the later conversion. So in this chart, we're looking at the average order value when organic uh, search began the conversion process. So users that were introduced through organic search, uh, those are shown in green. And then blue is the overall site conversion, um, average order value. For nearly all channels, we're seeing an increase in average order value when a customer first reaches the site through organic search or begins their experience through organic search. Um, likely they're building some trust authority by the fact that Google's recognizing them. And that may lead to a, a later increase in conversion. Um, definitely an opportunity to expand those efforts uh, to drive people in as it is going to lead to increased revenue down the line. Also want to look at ways we can analyze the strengths and weaknesses of the initial contact strategy. 
so here we're looking at the uh, first touch paid search uh, split by branded and non-branded, non-branded on the left, and what the bounce rate is by channel. Um, so here we can see uh, non-branded paid search, we're looking at about a 29% bounce rate, uh, whereas branded paid search is at 18% or 19% overall for organic. Opportunity here, uh, we may want to look at adjusting what the bid strategy is. Uh, are we bidding on the right terms? Is non-brand the right focus for this content? As well as, are we delivering on what the user ex expects? If this is a very brand or marketing heavy landing page and they're coming in from a non-brand informational search, they're likely going to bounce much quicker. Um, so we would want to look for opportunities to revise and adjust that initial contact strategy to bring the bounce rate in line with what we're seeing from some of the other groups. And this is my favorite, um, getting more insights into how those initial contacts become conversions. So the bar on the right in dark green is overall organic search from a first touch standpoint. Uh, so revenue that was brought in uh, from users who first experienced the brand or came in contact with the brand via organic search. And then to the left of that, we can see how this looks from a last touch standpoint. Um, so almost half of the revenue brought in from organic search it is still closing out with organic search. So we see people entering the customer journey, performing more searches, coming back, um, definitely helps our numbers. Uh, but when we, we do start to see areas where we can better cooperate between the channels, so paid search is a very hefty closer for organic in this instance, um, same with affiliates and email, opportunity to adjust where we have the, where we are appearing, what kind of users and searches, um, topics that we're targeting to better initiate and then close out through paid. And that brings us to the end. Um, so I know we, we have our, our breakout session or with a, a couple of options, uh, we do have a, a breakout session uh, where we can, we have uh, representatives who will run through some of the uh, case studies, uh, how DACs um, used uh, content marketing in the past. And option one, if you would like to geek out with me, uh, we have a general Q&A on ev everything we've covered today. Perfect. And I am opening that room now so that breakout room should pop up for you if it didn't you can click the little squares on the bottom of your screen and this is breakout room and that'll get you there once you're in the breakout room if you do want to come back and join us you can do that too all right bill we've sent everybody we've sent oliver over emily and mario they're in there with shannon so we just got the room to ourselves now so all right let's start with some questions. Yes. And I'm going to go ahead and pull this down. And the first one that we have is so, you know, we did talk about a B2C journey in here. And so Bill, you know, from your perspective, perspective, um, how does this journey different, you know, for B2B? Or is it the same? Uh, that's, that's a great question. And uh, I, I do want to be clear when we're looking at the journey, it's going to vary by user too. Uh, so this was illustrative of, you know, what we see from a typical customer experience where they're going through. Generally, B2B, we may see um, additional points in the planning phase where there's more research going on, but still the same general touch points. There's an initial need. Um, so the potential customer or business uh, becomes aware that there is uh, some need they're either not delivering on or need to fulfill begin searching or planning and then researching what the different options are uh, either within comp a competitor set within the uh, vendors that are out there um, but doing that research and ideally closing out to a conversion so it is going to be a similar process with similar triggers um, generally more leaning into the business and probably more on the closing uh, conversion end than um, the average consumer would be. 
and the type of content that you would want to produce would obviously be much different, um, similar goals, but we probably don't want to use the same uh, marketing methods on uh, for a major business as we would for Michael. Yeah, and I would add to that, you know, agreed 100%. I would add to that, though, you know, we're still selling to humans. So just keep that in mind when, from the B2B perspective. And I come from, you know, manufacturing space where, you know, marketing could not be drier. So let me tell you, just, you know, you're still selling to humans at the end of the day. So, um, all right. Awesome. Martha has a question. Oh, sorry, sometimes they move on me. Let's go. All right. Martha's question left. So let's pull, let's pull Tiffany's. How can we find the attribution? So this is a little specific, but how can we find the attribution for a specific piece of content? Um, you know, one that was recently published on their blog. A little unclear in the question. Um, is this narrowing it down to one piece of content or? I am thinking that Tiffany is looking for, you know, maybe like, Google Analytics, like Tiffany, what are you using for analytics right now? Um, so if you can add a little context there, um, how it's currently set up, if you're looking at first or last touch, but um, unless they have that set up, they're not they're not just going to see that, correct? Bill? Yeah, it's not going to be a default option. So you would, yeah, assuming Google Analytics to simplify things, um, J4, cool. Basically, uh, it would be the same process as far as assigning what the value is or what the goals are of, of that piece of content, what KPIs you measure. Um, same process, but just filtered to the what you're looking at first touch, filtering to that specific page that you're analyzing. Um, so it's really more of a, a lens to the same measurement um, and drilling down into one piece of content. Um, and that could be shown in the, the landing pages um, as a landing page report. All right, question from Arnella. So, and you know we're gonna get these questions. So how can AI assist us in creating content and to what extent do you recommend it? I know SEJ has our standpoint on this, but where does DAC stand? Yeah, and I, I, I think Overall, what you, you want to look at is not how it's created, but what the goal of the content is, who you're writing it for and what you're trying to accomplish. Um, so with everything having a specific purpose, if you are creating using AI to create content for the sake of Google and rankings, I, I could not recommend it less. If you are using it to refine your process, um, help your content creators with ideation, outlines, things like that. I think it can be great. So there's going to be a mix in need, and it's really coming into what the intent is from both what you're providing and what Google's going to infer as the intent. Um, Google's made some statements in the past that they're okay with AI content. I think we all just lived through the March updates, though, and there were a lot of impacts to AI uh, content. So if you are taking an audience centric approach, looking at what your customers or what your audience are specifically searching, searching for related to your business, relevant to your business and their needs, and you can provide an answer or solution with content um, and AI happens to be how it's generated. I think that would, that would be okay. It's really coming down to the intent of the content and why it exists. Right. And it goes back to the comment that was made about the B2B marketing is make sure that it's human to human. And that's the one piece, you know, make sure that it resonates. And so, yeah, we don't recommend using AI for content creation, but rather for inspiration. Uh, right. And for, yeah, guidelines and giving you a place to go. Yeah, it's a great tool. I would not rely on it solely, though. Yeah. Yep. A hundred percent. And so Martha has a question. And again, this is another one specific bill, but, um, you know, looking at this, can you walk us through what a journey might look like if they're not an e-com? Um, you know, so maybe they don't have a product to sell. What might, what might that content look like? 
Yeah, and it, it will depend on uh, what the what the eventual conversion is and what the goals are. So again, aligning to um, your final uh, conversion goal and then what's going to best support that as, as people are beginning their journey and running through it. So let's use a cable provider as an example. Uh, you're going to have an audience that still begins with hopefully a need. It could be a trigger. They're upset with a pro satellite provider or other provider. Um, they've begun researching or they're just looking to expand to get the latest games. They're still going to go through the journey as far as a, a beginning, uh, multiple touch points to consider along that path. Um, but the final conversion may be set to something different, either a, a download, a contact. There's any number of ways that could be, be set. Um, I would want to have some form of goal of what would make someone either a, a customer or um, an ongoing engager with the brand. Um, but for the most part, it should remain fairly similar other than how the actual conversion is being triggered. Yeah, instead of putting something into your cart, you know, what's that other action that they're taking to get into your funnel? Sure. Yeah, and that would be more of a the tagging would, would define that. Mm -hmm. So a question from AD, would love to know about the attribution when the middle and final parts are high value sales handled by one-to-one -one live human, so. That's a great question. That gets complicated. Um, it will depend on if this is in person or via the phone. There are a number of ways that it can still be tracked, such as call tracking if via the phone. Uh, you can provide different numbers, based, phone numbers, based on the channel that the user comes in through, which will allow you to then uh, trace those contact points back to the initial channel. Um, that is going to be, this is going to get a little bit harder in attribution. Um, most likely, you would need to integrate your CRM solution uh, with your analytics data um, to inject that touch point within your main conversion flow. It's really going to come into what what levers you can pull to connect your your offline to online. I probably recommend the CRM uh, solution, depending on depending on your your tech stack. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. So Catherine is building a content marketing strategy from scratch. What do you re recommend for starting to track and measure those pieces? And I mean, if you're just starting, that sounds like the optimal time to like actually build this out right, right? Yes, and this will depend a, a lot on the, the website itself and what's been done in the past. Um, if this is a newer website, you're really going to be focused on, on building authority, engagement, and other signals to let Google and other engines know that you are an authority in the space, even though it is a newer website. So there is a, you're probably going to be focused more on the thinking and planning type of content, um, making sure that you're getting users to your site, giving them an experience in line with what they expect. So they're remaining on site, getting that time on site signal up and demonstrating to Google that you are authoritative. If you are an existing site, but have not done content marketing in the past. Again, looking at where your customers are generally starting. Um, so we've been using a first touch attribution lens to find what's resonating with them currently and uh, building upon that. Um, and then determining what those common touch points would be, whether it's uh, multiple channels, but at least knowing where, where those triggers are taking place, what are the common needs your audience has? What are they seeking? What information? Um, and then building based on that. Uh, at BAC, we, we perform what we call our, our topical analysis, where we're looking at all of the keywords that are currently driving traffic to the site, as well as keyword research to see what other options are there, and then categorizing by topic and intent to look at where our strengths and our weaknesses within the customer journey what pieces of information do we provide to customers? What are we not providing yet? 
and where can that experience be improved? So there's not, it, it's going to be a sliding scale of where it begins depending on the site's need. Um, but again, comes back to defining what your audience expects and how that can be delivered to them. Yeah, and I think some of that is gonna, some of that depends on this question too. Um, with the increasing concerns around privacy and data protection, how do we balance the detailed content measurement and attribution with respect to user privacy? Yeah, this is going to get harder and harder. Uh, Google is definitely limiting what data is available. I think depending on how long you've been in the industry, you may remember when keyword unavailable became a thing and changed, changed the world. Uh, it's going to continue happening and, and we need to make sure that we're taking care of users PII um, there's no risks or leaks there um, but honestly we should still be able to track that user at multiple touch points we wouldn't know who they are what they're doing um, and that there may be requirements in depending on the ad platform or um, attribution that's being used. I know Google has a few cookie list options, things like that, Facebook, um, et cetera, that, that can come into play there. So it's really going to be dependent upon the technology that's available. Right now with the, the privacy um, rules and um, laws as they are, it, it hasn't really presented an, uh, an issue yet, but I, I think we all need to prepare for a cookie list future where that could happen. Yeah. Yeah, most definitely. Um, I think a lot of us are preparing for that already. At least I, I hope we are. Hope so. <laughs> um, right. And so, we have a, some great blog articles on the cookie list state if anyone wants to visit the uh, DAC website. Okay, we'll pull that blog and we'll make sure that that gets added in here. Um, okay, so question from Pedram. What happens to attribution modeling when the journey starts with a cold call or email and goes through lead nurturing? Great question. And this will again depend on what your connections are, um, whether it's your CRM to analytics. For most of these, I, I think that initial contact is probably not going to be attributed unless you have a well integrated CRM, which is where we looked at. Um, the customer journey with both thinking and playing and kind of condensed into one phase as you may have people who begin their web customer journey um, beyond just the, the thinking and dive right into planning or even doing um, you would want to make sure that you have content available at all steps of that, that journey I, I i think that's more of a strategy and as far as how we would integrate that with an attribution model though would again be um, technology dependent that the CRM um, system is connecting that to online. Um, and at some point we would need to cookie a user and make that connection either through filling out a form or else, elsewise. Um, otherwise you may need to track the journey post call to call. So here's one from Arnella. Um, how many different keywords should we use in a single blog post? How many times it should, re should it repeat? Um, and what's a good number to use on the entire website? And I know that this, you know, I've been around the SEO community long enough to know that, you know, it depends, but we're going to go back to that human readability as well, Bill. So how do you want to handle this one? Yeah, <laughs> um, it's definitely one I, I can't give a binary answer to. It, it will depend. I have found it most effective and DAC as a whole has found it effective um, to not focus on the keywords that you're using within a blog post, but what are the topics that people are trying to either find a solution for, find more information? How are they searching for it overall from a topical and thematic standpoint and make sure that you're providing content that directly aligns and fills those needs. Um, so for instance, uh, with, Michael shopping for glasses. If there's a lot of, you're seeing a lot of search demand around updating prescriptions or a new material that's out, 
you may want to include that information um, and make sure that that's present if people are actively looking for it. Um, but there's not so much a, a hard number I, I'd recommend as making sure that you're directly aligned to what the audience is seeking. Yeah. I mean, you want it in those strategic points, right? In those strategic strategic places, but not overkill. It still needs to read, read well. And you know what, Bill? With that, we've gone through most of the we've gone through all of the questions that that they had. So, if anybody else has any questions, please um, submit them through the chat, through the Q and A tab. Um, you know, but going through this. You've given us a lot of great information. And this, like I said, this is one of my topic, one of my favorite topics to talk about is is funneling and you know really finding that value. I know one of the things, and I when we did the dry run on Monday, um, I noticed the slide wasn't in here, but you know, let's talk about like even the importance of looking. So this is kind of the bringing it all together. You know, where should you be looking for conversions? Um, one of the places is like, what is your mobile versus desktop? you know, conversion. So when we talk about attribution, and this is one of the things, so much of our traffic comes from mobile at SEJ, um, whether it's, you know, from social, from organic, from, you know, Google News, and we don't convert our mobile users as high as we do on our desktop, you know, so that tells us that there's opportunity there, there's opportunity to optimize. So do you want to talk through that a little bit deeper, looking at, you know, some of those specifics maybe that we didn't get, didn't get into with the deck? Oh, that's a great question. And I think there's there's a few steps I'd want to take on, on something like that. The most immediate impactful is going to be um, CRO analysis. What is the experience on mobile? Could it be improved? Is it as robust as desktop? Um, are there ways we can encourage mobile users? The other thing I would want we would want to look at is analyzing first touch for those users. Are they people who are in the mindset of converting? They may be people taking a lunch break or stepping away from their desk, reading an article um, on their phone. They may not be in the mindset to convert. It may be a better opportunity to ensure that you're keeping them on site, engaged on their phones when they're not in that conversion mindset. So if they are later, you're top of mind. You've built that presence, you've built that freaking trust um, and can engage there. So I would take a twofold approach of, are there ways we can improve conversion? We should always be looking at that. Um, and then is the mobile experience intended to convert or is it intended to engage? And then with that in mind, how do you adjust from there? Yeah, that's a great point. What's, what's the purpose? Um, and are you walking them through the right journey to get to that conversion place? Mm -hmm. So thank you, RB, uh, who left some details for Tiffany, who asked about the GA breaking it pay, breakdown, the page breakdown. Um, yes, we use a lot of Looker reports here at SEJ as well. I love Looker. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's to bring a it in. good point. You can definitely layer in your metrics and use Looker instead of uh, the Google Analytics default reports. Also would recommend, if you haven't, um, look in the Explore section. There are ways uh, you can create your own reports, options there, kind of similar to what Looker does. I personally like Looker. Once it's set, it's easy for everyone to use and share out. Yeah. The only thing I wish like that, you know, it doesn't have that some of the other dashboards, like the drill in, right? I want to drill in and I want it to tell me more. Um, but, you know, someday maybe we'll get there. Someday. <laughs> someday. All right, Bill. Well, um, I want to thank you. I want to thank Oliver, um, who isn't here with us, but in the breakout room, um, you know, for joining us today and for DAC, you know, being our guest, you guys brought some great information. So, you know, before we leave, is there anything that you want to leave our viewers with today? I uh, just appreciate everyone taking the time. Um, if, uh, my info is on the uh, DAC website. If you have questions or follow ups, I'm happy to help out there. Um, I think there, there's some exciting opportunities to evaluate what's being produced, what the intents are, and how well your, your content's aligning to those. So happy to share. Awesome. Well, cool. So 
uh, you know, at the end of this webinar, again, if you can stick around for that survey, it lets us know how to day went. Yes, Brian, you're going to get that recording. That's exactly what I was just going to say. So if everybody can watch your inbox, you're going to get the slides, you get the recording. We're also going to send out um, the slides from the breakout room in case you stayed here with us to listen to Bill's Q&A. So um, we'll make sure that we get those to you. Thank you, Pedro or Pedram. It was a great webinar. High five to everybody. Thanks, Bill, for being here. And thanks for all of the tech support that we had in the background. Um, and with that, we're going to let you all get back to your day. Hope you all have a great one wherever you are. And we will see you next Wednesday for the next SEJ webinar. Have a great one. See you all next time. Thanks, everyone.